Okay, then let's start. So good afternoon from Tbilisi. My name is Adam Busulanu and I'm a senior program officer at the European Platform for Democratic Elections, EPDE. Welcome everyone to our fourth and final webinar on the parliamentary elections in Georgia. As the election campaign comes to a close, voting is set to begin on Saturday. And by Sunday, we should have the preliminary results. The campaign has been marked by intense polarization. The ruling Georgian Dream Party has focused heavily on the war in Ukraine, framing themselves as champions of peace and traditional values. Meanwhile, the opposition has made democracy and uh, EU accession, the central team, accusing the ruling party of authoritarian tendencies. In essence, this election campaign has been framed as a choice between peace and war or authoritarianism and democracy. We've seen strong mobilization from civil society, young voters and the Georgian diaspora. Numerous NGOs, despite being called foreign agents by the authorities, are actively preparing to observe election day and help ensure the integrity of the process. And today we are happy to have representatives from the largest election observation networks in Georgia who are with us to share their perspectives and insights. Nino Dolidze is the executive director of International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy, ISFET, a key election watchdog in Georgia. And before joining ISFET, she worked at the International Republican Institute for a couple of years, and she participated in more than 20 domestic and international election observation missions, including those of OC, ODIR, IRI, NDI, NMO, in Georgia and abroad. Nanuka Krashvili is a director of the Democratic Institutions Support Program at the Georgian Young Lawyers Association, Gaila, and an Oxford reporter on international law at Oxford University Press. And finally, Michel Benidze is a programs director at Georgia's European Orbit and currently leads the methodology working group for the My Vote election observation mission within the My Vote for the EU coalition. The coalition is, is something we, uh, I hope, will uh, discuss uh, more uh, deeply a bit later. Michael has over a decade of experience of working on promoting democracy, electoral integrity, human rights, and tackling disinformation. And, and in his previous life, he was also a, a director of ISFET, and he was uh, he was uh, he was there in Watson 2012 as EPDE was born. So thank you for uh, joining this webinar. But before we start, and I saw already a, a, a short info here in the chat, the webinar is recorded, and you can watch it afterwards on the EPDE YouTube channel. And you can ask questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. So let me start with you, Nino. Um, what are your impressions of the final stage of this election campaign? Thank you, Adam. Thank you for introduction. And uh, I hope, uh, uh, yes, uh, it will be interesting webinar. And uh, really, we are two, two days ahead of our one of the most important parliamentary elections, and I will briefly talk about ISFED findings, and then I am happy to answer also the questions. Um, as Adam also highlighted, um, I would say that uh, these elections in Georgia are considered one of the crucial because it is conducted under EU candidate status, and European Union was very clear uh, in its uh, recommendations saying that further integration of uh, Georgia's uh, European path is very much dependent on how competitive and free and fair these elections will be. That's why we see these elections as an opportunity on one hand to uh, conduct it democratically and move towards EU integration. But of course, because of that and many reasons, there are high tensions. 
And let's, let me say that, yeah, it's highly polarized environment in pre-election environment right now. Most of the actors are calling these elections as a referendum, uh, ruling party calling a referendum between war and peace, while uh, other opposition political parties and public in general, maybe bigger uh, part of the public is calling it referendum between EU integration and democratic development and moving back towards Russia's orbit. Uh, so ISFAT have been monitoring pre-election environment from June 1st and now tomorrow we are issuing our uh, pre-election environment report and main findings. One is that the rhetoric for this election was unprecedented because we never had in Georgia's electoral history, anti-Western, Eurosceptic rhetoric, what we are hearing right now. And of course, it is worrisome because on one hand, we are moving towards new integration and Georgian people wants to hear that. But we have seen huge anti-Western, Eurosceptic narratives throughout the uh, campaign, in, campaign period from the ruling party. And also, unfortunately, we are hearing also anti-democratic rhetoric, uh, saying that if ruling party gets the constitutional majority, they will ban opposition political parties. And of course, this kind of rhetoric is uh, problematic. From the opposition political parties, uh, whatever we are hearing, mostly they are campaigning on EU integration and after elections, implementing reforms, which is needed for EU integration. Sometimes there are discussions about economic development and some of the social issues. The space for civil society organizations, uh, you know, that is shrinking. On one hand, there is uh, this Russian law, but also besides the Russian law, we are seeing increased, of course, discreditation campaigns against civil society organizations. And now we are even seeing civil society leaders on the campaign materials of ruling party which is first time for the campaign. And also because of this uh, discredited campaign for a long time now, uh, we are having uh, problems with the election observation mission. Although we have quite a large number of people under our election observation mission, we are hearing every day that there is intimidation and pressure on them so that if they uh, observe elections through its fed mission, they may have some problems or their families may have problems about their public jobs or social assistances. So, of course, this rhetoric and discreditation campaigns are negatively affecting our observation missions. Now, one of the main findings, again, and this, this is not novelty, is that um, we have uh, um, the huge uh, use of administrative resources. Uh, this is not new for these elections, but again, there is blurred line between the government and the ruling party. We have seen a mobilization of public servants, uh, school, uh, school and uh, uh, kindergarten teachers on uh, ruling parties rallies. And uh, of course, we call it use of administrative resources. And we are also seeing, for example, ruling party candidates campaigning on local government events, for example, which is prohibited because state budget and local government budget is another and like state uh, funding and state programs. And ruling party campaigning on that is, of course, again, uh, blurring lines between the government and uh, ruling party. The uh, election administration uh, is preparing for these elections, and we have seen quite high uh, voter education campaigns, but composition of election administrations is still problematic. What we have seen and observed, the lower level of composi composition, we are seeing that sometimes people who are hired as poll workers or district election commission members, they are, uh, for example, public servants, sometimes loyal to one single political party. We are also seeing increased Russia's information interference in Georgia's uh, pre-election environment, uh, whether it's official statements or like uh, activities in social networks, anonymous uh, activities. And uh, for example, based on ISFED investigation, Meta deleted coordinated inauthentic behavior from Russian networks, trying to influence Georgian voters. And of course, this is problematic. And also, we are also hearing that some of the ruling party statements amplified by 
Russian actors, for example, about ap apologizing, or us about the war, or these uh, unfortunate banners using Ukraine's war for political electoral purposes. Uh, last, uh, what I want to also underline is that um, recent trend we have observed in the election is uh, uh, like uh, uh, activists uh, of ruling party are trying to uh, collect uh, personal data and information of uh, people as a supporters and uh, according to Georgian legislation, uh, processing, collecting personal information is illegal. Uh, and also we have seen uh, ID confiscations or asking for IDs to peoples in the regions uh, in exchange of money. And of course, we don't know the scale and the reason, uh, but what we can say uh, for sure that we have several cases when people were asked to give them ID cards. Uh, and we are thinking that it can be uh, used for uh, like decreasing the uh, support of maybe opposition or using these ID cards in a different way. Of course, this is problem and we had uh, press conferences and briefings and uh, um, uh, we called the investigative bodies to react on this matter because it is really problematic and it's violation of the criminal law. Uh, finally, uh, uh, what we can say is that uh, like violent cases, we, we do not have that much violent cases, for example, during pre-election campaign, but this intimidation and pressure on voters, uh, those who have some vulnerabilities, not to lose their jobs or not to lose social assistances, we are of course seeing this uh, during the campaign. And of course, we are hearing uh, also information from bridges that, for example, people are uh, afraid that their vote will not be secret, so that with the new technologies, what we have, somebody can check who they voted for, and we are having a large information campaign on that, that vote is secret. So on election day, we will have, this is very brief, briefly uh, our findings, on election day, we will have 1,500 observers throughout the country and also outside uh, of country. Uh, we will have static observers as well as mobile groups, also district election commissions, and again, out of country observers. We will have several press conferences uh, during the day, and on the second day, we will have fi final assessment of election day. Uh, we are looking forward, trying to defend uh, Georgia voters' rights and be there presented. And here are some of my colleague organizations, and we will try to coordinate as much as possible to cover as many polling stations as needed. Thank you, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Um, thank you, Nino. Maybe one one question on those on those IDs because this is, I think, of particular interest here. Just before the election day, what what do you actually expect? Do you expect that just people will not be able to vote because they give uh, the the IDs away, or somebody is collecting those IDs to vote for those people? Yeah, and thank you Adam, for this question. It's very difficult to really know what's the plan. If we can somehow assume what can be. One is to, for example, decrease the turnout for the people who is not supporting ruling party, maybe be their assessment. And second one can be attempts of vote with these IDs, but it's not that much easy, of course, because there will be observers, party representatives, but there might be attempts to do that. And also it can be just some um, intimidation and like kind of pressure on voters, because sometimes it's not taking out, but demanding, and some of them do not give, but still, because this is ongoing, or for example, personal data collection. In some cases, they are not taking IDs, but they are taking ID numbers, for example. And this is more for the intimidation. So there might be different kind of uh, um, uh, ideas behind that. But again, one, that these people do not know, vote. Second, that anybody else tries to vote with these people's ID cards. And third one can be just pressuring people and threatening them. But anyways, it is prob problematic, of course, because it's, again, if people do not have IDs, they can, cannot vote. Because in Georgia, you can vote only with ID or passport, and not everybody have these both documents. Mostly people have IDs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you for this clarification. Um, Nanuka. 
could you please share your findings, your recent findings? Um, as I understand, you're to some extent also coordinating efforts with with the other colleagues, um, but you have also a large number of observers uh, deployed to the to the regions. So, what is what is your observation? Um, thank you. First of all, thanks for inviting me. And um, well, um, you're correct. We are uh, coordinating with uh, fellow organizations and we don't have as as big of a mission as ISFED here has or the coalition. Our um, observers are around, um, I think, more than around 650. And we are, but with these observers, we're going to be covering 1,500, more than 1,500 polling stations, which is half of the polling station uh, of Georgia. Um, and we are, will be covering the vulnerable societies as well as the uh, my, uh, places they inhabited by the minorities, ethnic or religious. And we will be covering the, the uh, regions of Georgia. We have offices there as well. So they will be make local headquarters for, for the local observers as well. And actually one interesting thing that I know also that uh, um, our colleague organizations have done as well is that in this year, uh, we have changed our methodology in a way that um, to ensure that our uh, most of our observers are able to vote where they reside and where they live. Um, and in, uh, before we wouldn't do that because we, we, would, um, we would put them somewhere where they wouldn't feel the pressure of their neighborhood or someone they know. Um, and this was the methodology that we followed uh, throughout these years. And, um, and now we have changed this because of uh, the, such a huge um, public uh, feeling and response to what has been happening to Georgia. Um, especially with regards to Euro integration. Uh, uh, with regards to our findings, uh, we actually have uh, published three interim reports, and today we had the final um, assessment of the pre election period. And what we found um, uh, during this time, and so we actually we started uh, monitoring the pre-election period since April 2024, and of course, in April there wasn't much. Uh, there wasn't official pre-election period started. However, we believed um, we believe that um, this social infrastructural projects and stuff like that really influences. Uh, whatever is happening during the elections or pre-election campaign. So we uh, started earlier so that we would um, detect any kind of manipulation that the, the ruling party would do with regards to social projects, budgetary amendments, for example, or administrative use, uh, resource use. And uh, we did find stuff, uh, things like this. Um, for example, we identified 13 major social and in infrastructural projects, including amnesty, uh, for instance, for, and it's a very unprecedented amnesty project, which is a humane, humane act, for example, to, to do that. And we support it. However, uh, when it comes to uh, granting amnesty to thousands of people two months before, one and two months before the elections, there are some doubts about uh, voter manipulation here. Um, we also have identified a lot of the projects, re uh, uh, reconstruction of parks and roads that should have been started last year, for instance, but they suddenly started this year. So all of these tactics, they're very old, old school tactics, of course, but we have uh, put them forward in, in our report and said that th they are still doing this and we are, of course, it is a not violation of law. However, it's a bad practice that should not be happening so close to the elections. Um, Nina already mentioned use of administrative resources. And um, actually, again, this is like a classic example of how the political party can uh, manipulate uh, its population into voting uh, to, uh, to towards some degree. But then again, we see that um, the resources that were used are so are very um, they they differ in nature. They are very um, um, uh, multifaceted. Like for example, they are using education, education, education sector, very vulnerable uh, part of the society um, when it comes to teachers and directors. 
Um, and we have seen actually mobilizing of these people, as Nino mentioned, on the concerts and all the demonstrations of Georgian Dream. And we have seen, thanks to media, we have seen actual footages of how directors, for example, or people in that kind of positions influence teachers or teachers in the kindergarten, for example, to come out uh, in the demonstration for them to stand there in support of Georgian Dream. Um, and and of course, the uh, public servants and the civil servants uh, mobilizing. And in Georgia, we don't, there's one in, important thing that there's a gap in the law uh, that social agitation or campaigning to for someone, a political party, is not um, specifically prohibited uh, when it comes to social media. I mean, it is pro prohibited, but social media is not identified as one of the outlets for, for this activity. So it is al always very uh, vague when it comes to civil servant um, campaigning on their social media when it comes to Facebook or, or things like this. And whenever we complain, the response is very ridiculous from the CC. They usually say that a, a child was sitting at the computer or the husband or a wife was sitting at the computer. And that's how they posted a campaigning uh, video or a post. So this is how ridiculous it can get when it comes to election law violations, whenever that there's no political will or there's no um, any kind of will to actually uphold the principles of, of, of election, free and fair elections. And this really brings me to, and I will be very quick and I will mention this very quickly. This brings me to institutional freedom. And what's happening. Um, this was uh, here. And this was one of the findings, of course, uh, of our reports that we see CEC, Anti-Corruption Bureau, we see Communication Regulatory uh, Commission, who is in charge of broadcasting, uh, who is in charge of regulating the broadcasting in Georgia, um, as well as the courts. We all see all of these institutions that uh, are um, working together in uh, in a uh, uh, in hand in hand with the, with the Georgian dream and their decisions with blanket decisions when it comes to election of law violations and they are not reacting to election law violations at all and these are the very institutions who are responsible for for such uh, for punishing such violations and upholding these kind of principles and i will just very, very quickly just mention for instance um Anti-Corruption Bureau. Anti-Corruption Bureau has recently, um, uh, well, a TI's representative is not here, the Transparency International, just very recently uh, started going after civil society actors and naming them as a political actors. And this is an unprecedented thing, of course, and they retracted this um, political actor uh, status from Transparency International, for example, because Prime Minister asked the anti-corruption bureau had to do so, which also blurs the line between, uh, you know, democratic institutions and what 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 they should mean. But this is a very alarming um, tendency because it means that Georgian Dream, Georgian Dream's goal is for to create um, a system where Gaila, Isved, Ti, the coalition are not trusted, are not credible in public. They are labeled as political actors or someone with political interests. So whatever we find, whatever we find after the elections, whatever we say, if we say that they were not free and fair, uh, their response would be that you have a political interest. And they will tell people that they shouldn't be trusted because they have political interest. Do you remember? They have this like influence from foreign forces and, you know, uh, stuff like that. So I will not go go uh, on on and on about this anymore. I would just uh, stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Nanuka. A, a question uh, directly connected to this. Would you would you say that that the um, um, that the authorities abstained from misusing the foreign agent law and at the same time use those uh, institutions you've mentioned, the, 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 the Anti-Corruption Bureau, Communication mm -hmm. Commission, uh, to um, yeah, at least damage the image of, uh, of the um, election watchdog organizations. Yes, that that is that's on point. That's exactly what's uh, what's happening. And also, I just I would add to that that uh, the Russian law, as we call it, the law on foreign influence, um, it has it really contains a lot of bureaucracy, 
and they wouldn't be able to uh, implement it and enforce it correctly with the fines and huge fines actually that is in the law until the November. So until after the elections would pass. So what we think is that they just came up with more elaborate and better and simpler way to impede the this process. So anti-corruption bureau is al already set up. CC is there. They can control courts. So why not just use already existent uh, mechanisms and then and after the elections, we will have time to enforce Russian law or not even. Just um, It's just a matter of convenience for them. So, yeah, that was a great, great question. Thank you. Thank you, Nanuka. Um, uh, Misha, to continue uh, about the challenges for, for the election observation, maybe could you uh, just give us uh, some, some more information about your, your initiative and how it came to, to this kind of mobilization? And and uh, how how you work and what what to expect where to where to meet you on on election day um yeah good afternoon everyone um i first of all about the um about the challenges uh, i absolutely agree with my colleagues and i I, tr I will try not to repeat anything um that they've said but i i i would i do, do want to recap in a sense and say that i think the main finding for these elections for this pre-election period is that it, the, how it has been how um, negative the pre-election rhetoric has been overall and how much it has been about fear and manipulating kind of voters through this fear of war, essentially. Um, and so uh, when it comes to the rhetoric, Nino, Nino was talking about uh, this, that um, the rhetoric is increasingly not only kind of leaning towards authoritarianism, but even towards totalitarianism in a way, because we have pre-election period where uh, the ruling party is uh, announcing that they need the constitutional majority in order to ban the opposition parties. I don't think if there are any, like I, I don't remember if there are any examples of democracies where political parties run on the promise of banning opposition parties. Um, and then uh, they, they're going, the, the talking heads of, of like uh, the people affiliated with the ruling party are going as far as um, the recently in the recent days there have been statements that um, the supporters, not only the parties, but the supporters and the voters of the opposition party should be persecuted. These are the words that they are saying and using and distributing. And this is something that then is being actively kind of shared and promoted uh, constantly on the pro-government media channels and various you know facebook or other kind of uh, online sources so that is uh, that that gives you the idea of kind of how problematic the pre-election rhetoric is uh, is completely and even the prime minister has um, made statements that well you know probably it won't be possible to do this, like to persecute all the all the supporters and voters of the opposition parties. Uh, so this is like this is unheard of. Obviously, we have never heard uh, had this type of pre-election period in Georgia, even in the elections where there was where there may, where there were many different kind of challenges and problems. And then obviously, I'm not even talking about um, colleagues were talking about it, but this uh, the Russian law, which is essentially was designed to limit the civil society and limit the media outlets, the independent media outlets that are receiving uh, support from our Western partners. Uh, so obviously that is also a pre-election promise in a way that, uh, um, yes, they could not enforce the law or they chose not to enforce the law before these elections, maybe to avoid a lot of kind of negative um, I don't know, negative backlash about this, but essentially we know that this law is in effect uh, in Georgia and it, it effectively um, intends to limit completely the civil society that are critical and the media outlets that are critical and different voices from uh, from those of the ruling party. So that is really alarming, um, kind of a big trend. And then if we go into the specifics of the fear uh, and manipulation of the war traumas, obviously Georgia is a country which has uh, had the experience of war. Uh, most recently in 2008, uh, with Russia, but also in the 90s earlier. So you cannot, you, there is no family essentially in Georgia who doesn't have, who uh, who hasn't been touched by war at some point within the last 30 years. And so this war trauma is very, very um, kind of alive in the Georgian uh, families and Georgian people. And, and that is being very negatively manipulated and used 
for for a while now since the start of the war in Ukraine, but um, especially for this pre-election campaign, where essentially um, the ruling party is portraying itself as the only guarantor of peace, and everyone else being um, kind of um, instigating the war and being kind of motivated to uh, drag Georgia into the war, and 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 part of this have been the very negative rhetoric. Uh, and hostile rhetoric towards our Western partners, uh, towards the European Union, towards uh, the US, um, and accusing them of dragging Georgia into the war or having the intentions to kind of open a second front through Georgia. Now, and this is obviously, you know, Georgia is a very uh, pro-Western country. 80% of the Georgian people, more than that, uh, support Georgia's EU integration. But obviously, this type of rhetoric and the uh, constant uh, dissemination of this type of propaganda through pro-government media channels, which have the widest coverage across Georgia and through other means, including the online outlets, including some pundits who kind of repeat this uh, pro-government lines, then uh, these obviously affects certain amount of people and it kind of with paired with all the um uh, all the you know imagery and everything from ukraine obviously this is quite problematic that people's um uh, feelings are being manipulated in this way and that is really problematic the the these the trend of this um uh manipulation with fear is what Nini was also talking about that is part of it as well uh, that um uh, uh, for example, the voters are being told that your vote will not be secret uh, or that uh, you know through these machines they will be able to understand who voted for whom or that uh, you know the the uh, this collection of the personal ID numbers or the ID documents itself this is also a mechanism to kind of intimidate and to instill fear. But having said all that, I wanted to also say that at the same time we are seeing a very positive trend as well. Uh, this year for these elections, and I don't want to sound all kind of negative and uh, and as as if like it's all problematic. I think what we see, and which is the most important, I think, is that for this year, I think for the first time, or at least for a long time, we see very strong mobilization amongst the people and amongst the youth to kind of engage into politics, engage into these elections. Uh, we see that you know, obviously, uh, those who have followed Georgia know that you know. Georgian youth have been very active in the last couple of years for all these protests against the Russian law, first in 2023, then this year in 2024. Uh, and we see that that uh, kind of that uh, you know, drive has not has not been lost and it hasn't evaporated. We see youth being engaged in a number of different initiatives. It, uh, it uh, There are around 130,000 new voters this year. We haven't had elections for three years, so there are uh, about 135,000 people who are going to be voting for the first time. And we, we think that for the first time, the turnout amongst the youth will be also very high because you see these kind of political issues, the elections being trending even on TikTok and on all the different platforms where these young people are. We also see a lot of them being kind of joining forces with us in our coalition as activists, as volunteers, including as observers. And we also see Georgian diaspora being very active. Um, so in the past years, it was often the case that you know, there was very low turnout among Georgian people abroad. We, we know that we have a quite large uh, diaspora abroad, uh, around one million people. Um, we don't have as many people still registered, but we have had very big kind of um, uh, interest in the last few weeks when they, they are supposed to uh, register in the polling stations abroad. Um, and so now we're going to have around 95,000 people who are in the lists to vote, uh, we we will see whether these people will be able to like how many of them will turn out to vote. But we saw that on a daily basis there were more than thousand people registering to to be on at the polling stations and to vote. So this is very hopeful sign, and it shows that the the democracy in a way is also kind of uh, awakening, and people are awakening to participate in democracy. In our case, um, I want to say that we. As, as uh, our colleagues, we've been kind of trying to uh, recruit as many observers as, as we can. 
and we had 4,200 applications to be uh, for people to be observers. Obviously, not all of them were able to uh, pass the, you know, there are certain requirements that they have to fulfill. Um, uh, but this shows already that we have a lot of people who are very much engaged. And we also have amongst our observers, very prominent people like actors, uh, writers, uh, um, uh, in, you know, the, the most famous Georgian opera singer is going to be an observer from our coalition, um, as well as other like influencers. So all these people have attended all the like very intensive trainings and they intend to be at the polling stations from like the beginning until the end, like every single regular other observer that we will have. So that gives me hope that these people are very much engaged. We had also a lot of young people engaging ahead of elections in voter education, in campaigning, talking about the European kind of prosperity and why the European Union matters for Georgians, but also talking about the new type of voting, this how to fill out these ballots, and motivating people to participate in elections and to be part of this uh, important election. So we also are going to be as a um, My Vote coalition, maybe a couple words about the coalition because you asked, this is essentially a group of 30 different or CSO, civil society organizations coming together. Not all of them have experience of observing elections, but everyone realized that after the Russian law, uh, this election is the most important battle for democracy in Georgia and the most important kind of uh, place where it, we have to make sure that every Georgian citizen's vote is protected and defended. So a lot of people have kind of, a lot of organizations have uh, uh, changed their other plans that they were planning and decided to join forces and contribute whatever they can, whether it's human resources, whether it's financial resources, or maybe spaces or whatever else they can to be part of this mission. And so we also have a quite large um, observation mission. We will have observers also at least uh, around 1,500 polling stations across the country in all uh, municipalities and um, uh, districts. So and on top of that, we're going to have about 130 mobile teams also going around the different um, uh, regions, the different uh, districts and going into some polling stations where we may not have static observer permanently stationed. So we are, this is going to be, and, and together, as, as colleagues mentioned, we are coordinating as much as possible to cover like as many polling stations and to make, to make sure that we, we have presence pretty much at all of the polling stations across the country. So this is, uh, I think, yes, it's a challenging pre-election environment. It's a challenging uh, time, but at the same time, there is a kind of also a great opportunity and a great mobilization and citizen engagement, and that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you, thank you. Hope is, is, is always always positive. Thank you, thank you for this also encouraging aspect of of this election. Perhaps this is another division, like a referendum, uh, uh, like or. Uh, a polarization between between the young and the and the old, maybe maybe this is another uh, another line uh, um, in between. But um, um, yeah, I would like to also to encourage our 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 uh, audience to to ask questions via the uh, the Q and A function uh, here, and we will collect the questions and uh, oh, there is. First question there, so we can perhaps maybe switch smoothly to the Q and A uh, uh, part of of this webinar. Can you elaborate on what you expect on E Day? Will it be a rather quiet day, or do you foresee violence against voters or observers? A valid question, I guess. Of, after your presentations, uh, who wants to react first? Uh well, uh, we do not really know because anything may happen, let's say so. There depends uh, whatever is in mind of the ruling party, let's say so, because I don't do not expect violence from people, of course. People want to go and vote peacefully. And as my colleagues already mentioned, people are motivated to do so and nobody wants to do any type of violence. They just want to go and vote. From people's perspective and a voters' perspective, of course, we see that there will be high turnout and they just want to go and peacefully vote. But we cannot exclude anything because, for example, during Russian law, we have seen the face of ruling party, unfortunately, vandalizing our homes and offices 
businesses and uh, taking out activists and uh, so uh, you never know what may happen because we have seen that so you cannot exclude but of course we hope for the uh, better and like we are optimistic that it will be high turnout from the people and very organizedly people will go and vote and we will do everything to do support that to have um, non-violent environments if there will be so we will try to, of course, defend uh, our voters' rights. Maybe colleagues have different opinion, but uh, this is what I. Think. I will. I would add something to what Nina said. Um, so, just recently, the um, uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs had uh, decided to have territorial groups in uh, Tbilisi during uh, not only but during the uh, near the polling stations. Um, and this would mean uh, police showing up, you know, just for the order. And in normal democratic country, having territorial groups of police or law enforcement officers, they're there to avoid or prevent any kind of chaos or, you know, any alteration, altercation between um, between uh, party supporters or so on and so forth. However, interesting fact is that, of course, we have low trust in law enforcement officers because of uh, what have we've seen during this protest, for example, that they fight uh, against uh, the peaceful protesters. And one interesting thing is that whenever, when the Russian law was enacted, uh, and I don't know if you've heard, but there was a huge um, uh, violence uh, against physical or otherwise against uh, civil society actors and civil activists. They would, uh, they were calling us on our phones uh, with threats and we, we wouldn't know who it was. They came to our houses and spray painted our offices and you know they did horrible things and one uh, man um, called Hareba who is like the nickname uh, but this man is a uh, head of the special forces and he was one of the uh, heads of the of uh, and one of the leaders of this um, of this movement and of these uh, events and this same person is uh, the, one of the leaders of these territorial groups and this the same person is sanctioned by the United States right now after all of these events so what I want to say with this is that yes we are expecting everything and we don't know yet um however knowing that these kind of people are in charge to keep other people safe kind of makes me think that they are there for another reason and not for safety of course so of course we have some doubts that it's it's never it's never calm but we really do hope that um nothing's nothing crazy is gonna happen but let's see Misha, what 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 are you doing to uh, yeah to 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 uh, guarantee the safety of your observers? Just a very practical, very practical, uh, um, yeah, question. Yeah, well, um, first of all, what I expect, uh, like for, on the previous question, what I expect is probably in most cases I expect high turnout, and I think especially in large cities we are going to see like the lines of people waiting to vote. Um, um, let's see if this expectation will come true, but I think th this is what we are going to be seeing. And uh, that is, uh, again, that's kind of that continues my positive kind of expectations and, and the uh, positive, um, uh, uh, I guess, outlook of what we might see. Of course, I will agree with the colleagues that anything can happen when it comes to the kind of potential escalations. And I, I don't think it's going to be right now to kind of in a way speculate exactly what what might happen uh, but i think most of us are most of us are experienced in this type of situations and most of us are ready to document and kind of react to those cases as as and when they happen and this includes also the safety of our observers obviously safety and and um, security of each and every person involved in our missions are kind of our is our top priority um, obviously we're not going to divulge all the kind of safety protocols that we have and how we are going to be reacting Thing, but each and every observer uh, knows uh, the kind of communication protocol in particular circumstances as we have trained them and we will have people to support them in case this is necessary. Um, but we again, we hope that this is not going to be the case. And if anything happens, those will be more isolated cases. At least we want to maintain that kind of uh, outlook and then should this happen obviously that will also be a finding for us um, uh, we have had in the past 
cases where um, different observers, for example, when I was at ISFAD, uh, when and 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 afterwards as well, when observers would be targeted quite often specifically, um, uh, and not necessarily kind of physically or some sort of in a security uh, component, but more through the hostel hostility in the polling stations by the polling station staff, like the commission members, and. Uh, uh, and kind of a trend of uh, uh, observers being expelled from polling stations uh, for one reason or another, usually like just made up reasons or just because they did not like the fact that observer filed a complaint as per like their as per the election code, uh, the observers have the right to. But it, we are ready for these type of circumstances as well for these type of scenarios. If the, if there will be like different uh, different observers targeted specifically and kicked out of the polling stations, we will still be able to continue monitoring those polling stations, continue observation. And so it won't be possible to kind of just completely get rid of the observer and then try to do something at the polling station. So in that sense, I'm quite uh, kind of positive and hopeful that um, we will be able to have uh, a quite wide uh, observation and then we'll see what type of incidents that might happen. Thank you. Um... There is another question here, uh, kind of drawing a comparison with uh, with the recent uh, elections in Moldova. How, uh, have you documented instances of illicit funding of political parties and or, or widespread money transfers to individuals from abroad, as it was the case during the recent elections in Moldova? So uh, let me answer these questions. We are looking at campaign financing, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, we do not really see money spent from abroad directly like that to political parties. There might be some attempts to do it in a different way, but at least whatever we are seeing in terms of uh, party financing now and whatever is also seen from the Anti-Corruption Bureau, uh, uh, like re uh, reports, uh, it's all like mostly Georgian money, what we see. Uh, but usually the problem in Georgia's uh, campaign finance is that, for example, ruling party is having more than others, usually, and uh, they have donate like there is two kind of uh, uh, money in elections. One is state funding and another donations. And uh, uh, like state money is for the concrete political parties from the 2020 elections and the rest of them are having donations and the, there is big discrepancies between the ruling party and the opposition in generally. Lately, last two months, we are seeing that two opposition parties are also having quite high uh, like donations. This is a coalition for changes and strong coalition and again, ruling party, uh, but it's still quite big discrepancies, generally speaking. Uh, the trend is that there are many people suddenly like donating to ruling party and even those people who do not have that much income throughout the year, but they are still donating. And this is uh, in general anti-corruption bureau's role to investigate that. But of course we do not see that kind of uh, investigation recently from anti-corruption bureau. Uh, and we see, for example, what they did with the TI Georgia. Uh, so, yeah, it's also instrument, and unfortunately, uh, with the hand of the government, because previously, for example, we have seen that there was a, a audit uh, as, like institution service, which was more active in terms of checking and this entire corruption is not. But again, to conclude, it's not money from abroad. It's mostly Georgian money, what we see. There might be some indirect uh, like um, money, but it's not seen and it's not uh, like uh, the, the seen on, on this uh, pre-election campaign for sure. If I may add here, just a oh, couple sure. words. Um, so our, um, my vote uh, coalition will have tomorrow, like the final assessment or uh, report in which there is a section about the party finances as well. Um, but yeah, of course, obviously uh, what Nini is saying is exactly the right. Um, but at the same time, um, you will see in this section tomorrow, a list of a uh, number of potential co potential kind of corruption cases in which the um uh, the donations to the ruling party are coming from the entities from the legal entities like you know businesses that have received cer certain type of state uh, procurements uh, and uh, or direct purchases from the state and so there is a lot we are talking about millions and millions of lorry that they have received from the state and then 
uh, they have also themselves donated uh, also quite large sums of money to the ruling party. This is this is a scheme in a way that we have been seeing in every every election or for a long time now. Uh, that in this way, kind of there are people who get favorable treatment in certain type of tenders, certain businesses, and then they donate the money to the to the incumbent usually. Um, so th there will be these cases uh, in the report, and you, we have uh, addressed the uh, Anti-Corruption Bureau to investigate these cases, but um, so far nothing has been, you know, nothing has come out of, uh, of that. Um, and uh, the other bit, I think, which is um, important to mention here is that Nini was saying, yes, of course, there's no um uh transparent funding coming from uh from foreign countries but the um in this case those countries that might have interest in influencing the georgian election they uh, are not going to be bringing those funds transparently through official bank accounts and therefore those actors will also not be you know declaring it so the, if there are any any such funds being moved around there those are done kind of under the table and therefore we will not have a lot of information and insight into that if if we're talking about the money do you expect uh, cases of voter bribing directly in the vicinity of the of of the polling stations on election day because we have seen this kind of cases previously like directly giving money or for example fuel vouchers or this kind of things so uh, we have seen it in the previous elections that we have even documented and because we have seen for example offering money in exchange of uh, uh, whoever is id card or whatever it might happen um, and uh, it, it's also like trying, they are trying to do it in a hidden way. So it's very difficult to see it actually because it's not happening like outside. It's not happening somewhere else, but uh, we may expect that too. And our focus will be that. Yeah, in previous elections, I wanted to add something to that as well. Um, in previous elections, we actually had a video of them putting, uh, giving money from you know one hand to another. But we couldn't use that video because, unfortunately, uh, that's not an enough standard of evidence for them to believe us that it was money. You could see that it was money. Our observers were there and they could see it. But in the video, it just looks like a paper. And they would probably tell us that, oh, that's not money. That's just paper. As I mentioned, they have very uh, creative ways of you know, answering and uh, substantiating uh, their decisions when it comes to complaints or any kind of violation. And this was actually during the 2022 Batumi by-elections, as I can recall, uh, when this happened. And unfortunately, we couldn't, um, the the video well, couldn't be used because of that, because, um, yeah, they wouldn't accept it as an evidence. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we uh, we lost Misha. I hope he will be able to connect, reconnect uh, um, soon. But we have uh, last five, seven minutes, and I I have at least uh, we have another question. So, so I would ask perhaps this one first. It is likely uh, GD will claim fraudulent elections for interference in their results turn out worse. Uh, than they, than they fish, <laughs> they wish, I guess, uh, like we saw in the US. Does the United Opposition have contingency plans? Ah, uh, um, well, so I can just start. Okay. Oh, Misha, is, Misha is back. We have a question about... Uh, about what the GD will do basically when uh, the election results are not satisfactory for for them and uh, and uh, and what is the what is the, the um, uh, opposition strategy in such a case? And Nanuka started to to respond. Yes, to well, um, of course, in this uh, we get this question uh, a lot. Uh, the possible scenarios and what's going to happen. And there's uh, many things can happen, actually. And the thing is that what, there's one option of uh, Georgian Dream wins and 
they don't don't accept. Uh, sorry, they accept it, but the opposition doesn't accept. Then the opposition win uh, wins, and GD doesn't accept it. So there's uh, various scenarios, but we have been hearing that Georgian Dream. Well, we have been seeing that Georgian Dream is focused on power and focused on. Um, grabbing this power and taking away power from the opposition or the other side. So it is very um, logical to assume that they will not leave. Um, they will do, first of all, they will do everything in their power to win the elections. But then again, they might not leave quietly if they lose. And this may translate into different things, not, not the uh, demonstrations outside or violence, not only this, but also uh, using the power they have, the resources, the, the network, the money they have to uh, discredit opposition, to, to um, discredit the process in the parliament, in the new parliament. So they can do many and various things. And I don't um, and I, I do assume that I think that, of course, Georgian Dream will have contingency strategy and the opposition might not. And this is just based on the facts that we have been seeing and how this has been uh, progressing. But then again, there's the Georgian Charter. I don't know if you've heard of it, but Georgian Charter that uh, president initiated and uh, almost every opposition party has signed it. And some some are skeptical about it. Some are um, uh, very optimistic about it. And I would just say this, that if we can call it a plan, then the opposition has a plan and the plan is to reinforce and implement reforms under the charter and take responsibilities for these type of things towards their citizens so um i think in this one georgian dream has an upper hand when it comes to resources unfortunately uh, the opposition doesn't yeah and when we're talking about the potential results uh how do you interpret the recent opinion polls, uh, which are basically completely contradicting. How can we read them and what can we actually expect in terms of results based on those opinion polls? Uh, it's like from our perspective, we try not to uh, talk about the expected results and it's better to wait to, till the final results because you know because of we are we are election observer if you were just political analyst it was it would be easier but you know we are really uh, trying to not assess polls and to base our results whatever there will be uh, but of course th this is not novelty there there are some polls showing that ruling party has majority and then uh, another type of polls. Uh, mostly from my perspective and this bad perspective, usually if it, it is poll, we are trusting ADI and IRI polls, but it has not done recently. But uh, there are some polls you can trust and there are some polls you cannot. So that's why fr from our perspective, we can say that they are expected that, for, for example, there will be exit polls also on election day, which might not be I mean, which might have different numbers also. So that's why we are we will expect uh, and wait final result. You know, ISFED is also doing uh, parallel vote tabulation. So we will have our own results and we will expect official results uh, um, then. And that's uh, like on polls. But maybe, Visha, you have, you can say more. No, I, I completely agree with you that I, I don't think we should be kind of speculating about what will be the outcomes of the elections and what will be the numbers. Um, obviously, you know, people can look at the polls and kind of track, you know, at, at one one way or another, the polls can be done in different way with different methodology, but uh, polls should be more or less on the, uh, on the, the trend should be more or less the same. And there are certain polls that are very clearly out of the trend. And so that's probably very easily uh, recognizable. And also it matches and it kind of um, is very much into the rhetoric of the ruling party, a particular poll, for example, which says that uh, the ruling party has 60% of the support or close to the 60% of the support. Um, uh, the ruling party did not have 60% of the support even in 2012, which was like a pivotal election when they came into power. So for me, it would be really highly questionable this, this particular poll or like looking at the history of that particular polling and then the results, one can see which poll can be a little bit more trustful, trustworthy and which cannot. 
But we are, we have to also say there are, of course, a number of polls being done, not all of them necessarily public. Um, and obviously, polls also differ from like the methodology perspective. Some of them are face to face. Some of them are telephone call, uh, kind of phone polls. And uh, it is uh, important to mention that over the years, for many years in Georgia, there has been a very high number of people who especially uh, on the question, who are you going to vote for? Either say that they don't know or they are undecided or that um, there's no party that is particularly close to them. And this is usually quite high number. And so therefore, oftentimes it's hard to speculate with the polls in advance because at the end of the day, like almost half of the population might be undecided. This year, there are even more people who are undecided, um, even like on the opposition spectrum, like someone might be um, might be thinking that they want to vote oppositional, but they might decide who they're voting for in the last day, so today and tomorrow. And and I think it is completely normal. So I wouldn't necessarily look into the, like polls can give us a bit of like a trend, an idea, but I wouldn't look into that too much at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I, I agree with Nini, but uh, this year, the the um, what we what we have the advantage is that there will be this preliminary result. So at the at the polling stations, which are electronic or the where the counting is done through these electronic machines, uh, we will be able to have the results quite soon, and we'll see uh, how the CEC is going to be publishing those. But at the same time, all of us, I'm sure all of our observer organizations from our observers will be receiving information very soon after after the uh, votes close. And we will have the kind of copies of the um, of these um, uh, fine uh, of the preliminary protocols in a way. So um, it. What I'm trying to say is that people do, will not necessarily have to wait for very long after those exit polls and kind of after immediately the polling stations close within the two hours, we should already have kind of a picture of the results, uh, obviously in a preliminary. And then, then those will change slightly in the non-electronic uh, after the counting of the non-electronic polling stations, but it should still show the trend. Thank you for mentioning uh, this. We could not, uh, you know, finish this this discussion without mentioning the the, the new voting technologies and uh, those machines. Um, and maybe and 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 yeah. Thank you for for uh, underlying this this very positive aspect of uh, of this. But it also perhaps uh, uh, um, challenges also your efforts as 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 observers. Maybe uh, could you just give us a very short. We are running out of time. A very short uh, um, uh, assessment of what you expect from having from those those machines or from the from the the effect of those machines on this on this election, apart of having the results very quickly, and how it uh, changes your approach of uh, your methodology of observation. And we know that the, there is a a certain that there is a reduction of of polling, of of the number of polling station. Basically, so we we, uh, we can have a very huge polling stations, at least in, in, in bigger cities, how this affect is the, um, the problem. If I may start on this, I think, yes, exactly. The, the This is one of the kind of points which may contribute to those like lines at the polling stations that I was saying. Um, uh, not necessarily that the process is like dramatically slower, but it is a new technology. People don't really know as much. So there it might not, like by default kind of the, it might there might be a little bit more kind of uh, time needed for them to familiarize what they have to do and how and kind of uh, be more cautious with the machine but at the same time obviously machines potentially there it's possible that the machines may break down here and there and obviously there are procedures how to address so, those cases but it might also kind of in some cases slow down the voting or in some cases, even though we think that the CC has been training the uh, polling station, you know, commissioners, uh, there might be commissioners that don't necessarily know all the details of these machines, or there might be the process might be slightly slow. But I don't think I don't I'm not sure if this is going to be dramatically kind of affecting the results or our observation. Uh, it might just make the process a little bit slower. Um, I don't know if colleagues have any other. Um, uh, issues to add, but I don't see. I wouldn't think that this is dramatically changing 
uh, an observer's workload or changing the approach of the observer. The observer still kind of has a lot of things to observe and sometimes even more procedures to kind of understand and to follow. And so I don't think it, 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 it I don't think it in a way undermines the role of the observer. The observer is still very important at the polling station. Any more remarks, Nanuka or Nino? Maybe um, on the expecting turnout, do they have an um, um, you know impact on the turnout at the end? Yeah, I will just uh, add very uh, quickly. Of course, they don't. Uh, observers will be uh, there to do that, and they will actually have more work to do because of the the technology side of it. Because we don't actually know fully and understand how it can be manipulated. Uh, with regards to turnout, I think there's gonna be like one very interesting thing that people would. There's two things like there will be category of people who want to go to polling stations because there's new shiny technologies there and just want to test it out. But then again, there's huge propaganda in Georgia ongoing about if you go to the polling stations if, and if you vote, they're going to know they're going to it's got to they're, the, the, they're going to see the stamp on when uh, what time you went there and what, what time you voted. And sometimes they even tell the coordinators, for example, party coordinators tell people to go from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. or 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. so that they would know uh, when they voted. This is all a lie, of course. There's no way that the stamps can be made, that people will know who voted for whom. Um, but this is one of the things that technologies that some people are using against technologies and using technologies for to spread this information and actually affect the turnout um, uh, on the polling station. So we are trying to fight that propaganda as well. Uh, so, Adam, you had final question no, about turnout. Yeah. Okay. Or I, I don't know. Maybe you had final question, and I can respond then. Uh, no, I think this that was the final question. We are already six minutes uh, beyond the planned time. So, if uh, if uh, Nino, if you don't have any any direct reaction to to this, I would say. Thank you very much. That's it from this beautiful minimalistic uh, EPDE office in Tbilisi. Uh, thank you, Nino Dolidze, um, Nanuka, um, and Misha for your insights. Um, for your insights um, on this last day or the two days, right before the election day. Um, yeah, so we are all eager to see what what will happen on on Saturday and. Uh, yeah, uh, let's hope uh, for a uh, very quiet and uh, and uh, a boring election day. So thank you very much. Stay tuned with epde.org and our uh, uh, social media. Uh, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.